Hello to everyone who's joining us on the Africa Football Business Show. This is the second episode of season two, and this season is concentrating on sports governance, governance uh, in the football world when it comes to Africa. And to Kinders here on the show, he is the Director of International Studies at the University of Wisconsin in Parkside, and then he's also a Professor of Political Science Welcome to the show, Dr. Welcome. Yes. Thank you, thank okay. you, thank you. I'm humbled to host you on the show, and I can't wait for you to talk about what uh, about African football and the whole uh, your, your wisdom on governance series, where you here we create conversations that actually shape the football industry in Africa. So uh, quickly, let's just get into it, Doctor. And um, what are the roots of your love for the game? How did you get involved in the game? Well, uh, good evening to you all and uh, good uh, morning or evening to all your listeners who are probably scattered around the world. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very pleased to be talking a little bit about all of this. Uh, now, to talk about my involvement in sports, uh, I think just like most of us, it was in the street. I mean, it was in the street, it was uh, in uh, the neighborhood. So we used to play on the little spaces that we had in our neighborhood. And then uh, that's how it started. And then at school, of course, you know, during the breaks, uh, that's how we get, we get, we got into it. And uh, since then it has stayed. Uh, even last Saturday I was playing again. So, mm -hmm. but, but I think that the most important and the most de determining factor was school. You know, especially when I left elementary school and went to um, a middle school, that was when I was a little bit more exposed to organized sport. Uh, we have this, the teams of our classrooms. And then very soon I was uh, in the U14, uh, U13 team of my, uh, my my school. So that that, that was it. That was it. And... Um, what made it even more interesting at that time was that, um, you know, we had emerged for, from coloni from uh, colonization. The country was independent, and uh, there was there was a lot of uh, political activity around us. Those were times of very intense political movement, turbulence. Back home, you have student movement. You had unions. You had uh, the fight against the neo-colonial governments. Uh, the continent was boiling. And then from Europe, you have uh, the 60s and the hippies and uh, uh, all of that. So those were very interesting moments for the mind. Yes. And why the political science, you know, despite you having a sporting background? Well, political science, because first of all, I went, to st I went and studied political science because I wanted to become a journalist like you, uh, Sean. That's what I would say. Uh, I wanted to become a journalist, an international journalist, but I didn't have that opportunity. But uh, although I played at a very high level in soccer, I should say that you know being a professional was never an option. It was not an option for my family. It was not an, an option for uh, you know my friends. And then there was also no opportunity for us to be professional soccer player. It, I mean, it was just impossible. You know, uh, we used to follow all these players that were in Europe, you know, for example, in Jolia, in France, uh, uh, Salif Keita, all those names, we used to follow them, but there was no way we could imagine even that we would become, you know, professional soccer player. So I went into political science and politics has always been at the intersection of almost everything that I do. Um, but I'm not talking about being a politician, but I'm talking about looking as an observer, all right? So I must say that um, I just continued with, with my politics and then came to the United States, fin uh, finished my studies, and then that was it. I was in higher education. So it was a career political science is interest, but it is also career. Yes. And now let's shift gears and go to our topic of the day, which is 
the FIFA fiefdom and where we'll see how that uh, strengthening Africa's position and identity when it comes to African football. So FIFA has been referred to a fiefdom in various quarters. Can you expound on the meaning of a fiefdom and how this has manifested in football? Well, a fiefdom is uh, basically, you know, uh, an, a, a country or whatever. It, it's, I mean, it's an area, if you want, or an activity in this case, that is controlled by one body. I mean, you can think about kingdom, you can think about empire, uh, you can think, you know, about, uh, you know, a corporation that is led by just one person. But, you know, the idea of FIFA being a fiefdom is that it administers and controls football around the world. Um, and it is the only body that does so. I mean, you, all the other bodies are kind of uh, uh, subordinate to, to, to FIFA, especially when it comes to rules, when it comes to calendar, when it comes to the way uh, the, the, the game has to be played. Um, they make all decisions and then uh, you follow. So they have a monopoly of the game. That's why it is their preserve. And what is interesting about FIFA is that it is supposedly not linked to a government. It is a non-profit organization. It is an independent organization, but uh, it's a very special beast in the sense that it operates like a corporate, uh, a corporate organization but at the same time, it is not corporate, let's say, like ExxonMobil or like all the other organizations that are making billions and billions of dollars. So yeah. that, is, that is it. That is it. And then um, um, they have operated in such a way that um, they had to maintain themselves, to maintain the game, which may be good. If FIFA crumbles, then the whole football landscape will be probably in a in a disarray but uh, at the same time there is a need for more democratic governments governance inside uh, fifa more open more openness yes and and a lot, now let's get down into those nitty gritty details i know you're saying in other words we can say fifa is powerful so uh, the fiefdom, the FIFA fiefdom is anchored on the concept of autonomy in football, uh, in essence, a governance model for, by FIFA for Africa and also with the other, you know, uh, continental bodies. What is the issue specifically on the African uh, soccer governing body, that is CAF and the African football federations and associations in general? Well, um, uh, FIFA basically... Uh, in, when it comes to uh, Africa, when it comes to uh, the, the, the governance, um, what I would say is that um, where you have strong strong control mechanisms, where I mean in Africa, for example, uh, we don't have those controls. You know, in a culture where we do not have st strong control mechanisms, where receipts, for example, tracing, archiving accounting are not an everyday practice it is not easy to have good governance and uh, unfortunately that is a business culture of of africa in general so from there i do not think that uh, we can uh, uh, CAF itself could be a very um, i mean could be i mean it could be a model for sure but what i'm saying is that CAF itself uh, is kind of uh, a reflection of what is going on at, uh, at the cultural uh, level, you know, in our society, in the business environment in our societies. So, um, let me. Uh, can you repeat the second part of your question? Uh, and, and just the impact of this whole FIFA fiefdom on CAF, the football federations and associations. Like, what do you think exactly is contributing to the bad governance in African football? Well, I've just mentioned that, but I also uh, mentioned, I mean, I will also say that in uh, in Africa, all right, um, you have all these governments that have emerged, you know, these one-party systems, uh, and uh, they think that they have to control everything. Yeah. 
So that was the beginning of it. But when FIFA came in, they decided, well, that they were going to create an autonomy and that federations were going to be independent from the government, which was, to, to me, is a good, is a very good idea, all right? Um, mm -hmm. It's a good idea in the sense that uh, it prevents, you know, governments and people from taking control of, uh, of, of the game itself. <clears throat> so, um, the impact of FIFA on CAF, um, you know, FIFA needs CAF, at least some of their leaders, because Africa is 50, 54 countries, and theoretically each of them has a vote, you know, within uh, FIFA. So from the time FIFA was created, you know, um, and then um, till now, especially under Blatter and first with uh, Joao Avelange, FIFA needed CAF. For example, uh, it was the times of apartheid. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, Joao Avelange really needed, you know, FIFA to take away, you know, uh, FIFA from, from, from the Europeans, basically, because it's been very Eurocentric in that sense. All right. So he needed Africa. So the apartheid movement became a catalyst. You know, the, uh, the, the entire apartheid movement became a catalyst in terms of creating, you know, a new FIFA. And then when Blatter took over, the idea was to expand uh, FIFA to the rest of the world, you know, and have other countries contributed, contribute to, you know, uh, decision making. Blatter also needed Africa. He needed the votes, you know, for his agenda of deploying football all over the world. And that is one of the importance, one of the, one of the things that Africa has to realize. We have that force, but the only thing is that we need to have one voice. If we don't have one voice, then we're going to be manipulated and then maneuvered all over the place. I'm going to give you just a simple example of how um, this works. You know, the, the, the Cameroonian team at, at some point, they decided to wear sleeveless jerseys. That, become, that became a big issue. And then, you know, FIFA, for no other reason than not maybe allowing these Africans to do this, all right, what they decided to do was to say, no, we cannot accept you wearing sleeveless jerseys. But at the same time, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the CAF did not disallow it. So Cameroon won the jerseys and, 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 and I mean, wore the jerseys and won uh, the African Cup of Nations. Mm -hmm. So soon after, uh, Cameroonians decided that they were going to wear a one piece, you know, outfit, which was uh, something unheard of. So when, you know, uh, maybe it's just because it is Africans, but when people are deviating from FIFA's norms or FIFA's expectation, then it becomes problematic, all right? Yeah. Now, the, recently they appointed, um, uh, I can't remember her name now, but they appointed, you know, one official to come and manage African soccer. That was in March for six months because of problems of corruption, problems of mismanagement, yeah. and so on Fatima and so forth. Samora. Yeah. This is yes, this is this is a very um, this is this is. I mean, it reminds me of the times of uh, structural adjustment programs, but this is even worse because why is it not possible to find an African, either designated by the union? By the African Union or designated by the federations themselves to try to solve an issue. Why does it have an intervention from outside to do this type of uh, re redressing? So those examples show that Africa doesn't have a lot of power in uh, in, uh, um, in I mean the FIFA governance structure. And the only thing that can make it powerful, really, is having one voice. Otherwise, it is not going, it's not going to work. And I know you're speaking about one voice. And when you speak like that, 
and, and over the years, we've seen how UEFA has risen. We've seen how the CONCACAF side has risen. But as you say, when it comes to Africa, there's no one voice. There's no trusting each other. And that is what some of the things that are lagging us behind. So what, which steps or what needs to be done for CAF to actually rise up and become a strong force on its own, even when, when it's under FIFA, how can it rise up? And you know, when, when CAF speaks, the world can listen and actually prove that how the world, how African football can improve. Well, what I would say is that FIFA is not the biggest issue of African football. And then we have to remove, you know, that kind of thinking of our minds. All right. I think that if we have to, if CAF is to be reinforced, one of the things that they have to do is to reinforce the national federations and to organize football at the national level. If this cannot be done, then CAF cannot never be strong. And then within CAF itself, within the federations, you know, um, they have to learn, they have to work together in the spirit of collaboration, in the spirit of cooperation, and not in the spirit of competition. You know, within CAF, you have regions that are competing. Mm -hmm. You know, the north. Is, form, yes, form, and, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, that has to change, and if that changes, then there is a possibility of having greater collaboration in terms of exchanging experiences, in terms of opening up so that we can learn from each other. And then maybe the third thing that is important for FIFA is that there should be some kind of pan-Africanist vision or framework. One of the weaknesses of African football is that it doesn't make money. It simply does not make money. I was watching some of the games last weekend you know, between African countries, uh, Tanzania and Kenya, for example, mm -hmm. there, were, there was nobody in the in, in, in the stadium. I mean, there was almost nobody in the stadium. So how could you develop football if you don't have people behind it, especially when you have a weak capitalist structure? Mm -hmm. All right. So that is something that is very important. We have to realize also that football, you know, uh, is not, I mean, we say football is big business, but it is big business for those who are equipping the teams, those who are selling, you know, uh, infrastructure and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that, you know, as, uh, you know, uh, developed by, uh, uh, in the book, Soconomics, the reality really is that football is not big business and it is also bad business. The returns that you get from managing a club are very little mm -hmm. when they work. I mean, we all know that, uh, um, you know, the um, Premier League, you know, uh, clubs, many of them are in the red. And it is the same thing all over Europe to the point that they thought that they had to look into it to find a way through a financial fair play, to find a way of regulating the spending of money and, 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 and regulating uh, this, the, the environment in such a way that clubs are not in the red because this is not sustainable. So we have to realize on this continent that it is impossible to develop big business in football when the majority of our people are poor. So we have to bring down football to the level. I was talking mm -hmm. to you earlier about being introduced to the game through the neighbor, through our, through my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We used to play in the street. Well, an idea, you know, for all this federation would be simply to have little, little football fields in the neighborhoods. So be you no know, proximity infrastructure, so people can just move and do what and play and go back home and they don't have to travel, you know, uh, 20, 20 kilometers or, or, or 15 mm -hmm. miles, the way people travel to go and play here in the United States, all right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. 
these are the things, these are some of the little things that, you know, federations, uh, those who are leading our leaders need to, need to, need to do, and need, uh, they need to be creative about these things for us to, to move. Otherwise, uh, it's always going to a vain, you know, attempt to emulate, you know, the big clubs in Europe, and then it's going to be failure over failure. Yes, and for and for a solution going forward, do you think organizations like the African Union and also the governments can actually work together with CAF or help promote football and improve football on the continent? Yes, of course. I don't know if the African Union is well equipped and well tooled, you know, to do this kind of work, mm -hmm. because it's more of a bureaucratic, bureaucratic uh, organization. All right. So they cannot probably work in very in every in every uh, country, and then on, they cannot be on the ground. But in terms of uniting, you know, the continent and providing one voice, they can play a role. They have a role to play. In some in terms of stimulating and uh, developing research about football, about sports in general, they have a role to play. In terms of you know, re, I mean, being the voice of the continent in some arenas, because FIFA is not going to allow the African Union to be there, right? <laughs> FIFA, FIFA yes. doesn't care about the African Union, all right? Mm -hmm. When they go to other venues like the International Olympic Committee, and th you know they can they can say they can be present, all right? Now, um, the thing about um, uh, the gov about governments is is exactly what I said earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, governments need to realize that they cannot make money out of football. And they cannot make money out of football in a place where there are so many people who cannot make a living, so many people who just cannot have the three meals or two meals even every day. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they have to be conscious of the fact that investing in football means investing for the people, meaning means working for, for the people. And it, it, it means, pre, I mean, creating an environment where people can express themselves, an environment where people can strike a modest living, all right? And that, that, that's it. So they have to take that, you know, upon themselves because Actually, when you look at the United States, when you look at Europe, you know, the infrastructure, the basic inv investment in, in, uh, in, in sports mm -hmm. is investment by the government. I mean, when I say government, I say the municip municipalities, I say um, uh, the states here in the United States, but it is, those are the people who build the stadium. Those are the people who make it possible for people to play. Yes. So our governments have to realize that they cannot afford to 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 neglect that. It's 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 like uh, a suicide for the whole continent because we have an average our the, the average age of our population is about you know 19, 19 years old, yes. 19, 20 years old. So what are you going to do with all these young people if you cannot provide infrastructure? So they shouldn't be thinking about making money. They should be thinking about investing, not for losing, because it's for the benefit of, of the society. Yes. And before we come to how even FIFA is contributing to a huge portion of the budgets, which I know when it comes to money, it complicates stuff, and maybe can't feel like... Let's talk about... Uh, Sepp Blatter. I remember when, 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 when you say the word FIFA fiefdom, everyone, most people think about Sepp Blatter because he was accused many, many times of making FIFA his own, like his own empire or his own kingdom. And then we had the power transition to uh, now Gianni Infantino. Is there any difference in African football since the change of leadership at FIFA? Well, the change of leadership uh, is necessary anyway. Um, you know, uh, it is necessary for fresh ideas and for new ways of doing things. But Seb Blatter, he was involved 
and his entourage were involved in many different, you know, malpractices and uh, corruption uh, scandals and so on and so forth. But that is not new in uh, football anyway. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we thought that we would be able to clean up. And then we have a new president at, in, at CAF. And then we have some the same thing again that happens. So uh, the big issue for FIFA is who is overseeing FIFA? You know, as it is now, it seems to me that they oversee themselves. You know, if the Americans had not decided that they were going to uh, burst, you know, the secret of all these deals in uh, in FIFA, maybe we would not know anything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, but, you know, Sepp Blatter needed Africa and one of his most faithful collaborators was uh, Ayatu. And what they wanted to do, they wanted to take, to expand the game. And Seb Blatter actually needed African countries. It was under Seb Blatter that eventually, you know, Africa got more representation in the World Cup. You know, he was the one, it was under Seb Blatter that they decided that the game was going to go out of Europe and that other countries were going to organize it. Mm -hmm. So when they decided to organize the World Cup in 2010, you know, European countries who always, I mean, that uh, which always think that, you know, everything has to be, you know, they have to be at the center of everything. They were not happy. So the, you know, corruption, uh, uh, South Africa, how can they organize uh, the, the World Cup and so on and so forth. I mean, they had already failed in 2006 and the cup and the, the game went to Germany, right? But as we shall hear later, we shall, you know, Germany it, it itself was involved in corruptive in, in corrupt practices for the World Cup to be to be to be oh, to be held in Germany. Mm -hmm. So, um, Sepp Blatter was very uh, was very instrumental in putting Africa on the map, and people were thinking that Africa would be, an African country would be the next winner of, of the World Cup. Mm -hmm. But, but the, the but the problem is uh, maybe not the leadership. The problem is you know the governance structure of FIFA itself. Decision making has to be extended, I think, to all countries, and then it must be part of the philosophy of uh, part of the vision, if you want, of, of of FIFA. You know, to create a system that is more equitable, I mean, at least less unequal. And uh, in that sense, something may happen. You know, there could be some change when it comes mm -hmm. to uh, the way uh, the game is managed and the way Africa is going to be, uh, to have a, a better place in the, in the system. That brings me to the point that we have to talk about, and it has to do with this money and the budget actually FIFA deals CAF, which seems to like have a hold on CAF. So complete autonomy is, is out of the way, definitely. It's out of the picture. What, what steps need to be done? What do you think need to be done to get to gain that independence as Africa? Because at the end of the day, when, when we have bad governance, that means it leads to you know poor leadership also even on the grassroots level, which leads to so much when it comes to African football being affected. And that means the talent and the upcoming footballers and the young ones who are in who want to get into the football world they end up cutting from all this you know bad governance going around so how can africa break or get some independence when it comes to african football because of that hold of the budget fifa budget or uh, that fifa budget that goes to cut well as i was telling you earlier um you know um uh, fifa does what they, they do and they do it for themselves all right and you know in terms of budget the money that comes out of fifa if you want is important because governments have a kind of uh, uh, they, 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 they are not they are not responsible they are not, they are not taking responsibility for what they should be doing that's why fifa's money is so important 
when you take Morocco, for example, mm -hmm. the government has, inv has invested recently so much money in the building of infrastructure and in modernizing what existed before. And, you know, they have been bidding for the World Cup mm -hmm. and uh, in the process they have been modernizing. And it is not, basically, it is not private, you know, organizations that are doing it in Morocco. In Morocco, every federation gets enough money from the government directly. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, they channel money into football, for example, through television rights. FIFA, what, 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 what the, the income of, of FIFA is what? Mm -hmm. Is television rights. Yes. You know, the money that they get is television rights, usually when they organize the World Cup. So why can't we develop such structures in our own countries? That is one thing. But mm -hmm. the government at this stage has to, has to jump in and do what they have to do. You, 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 you see what I mean? So mm -hmm. the countries, I mean, countries like Benin, for example, I think if I'm not mistaken, FIFA gives $500,000 to every federation, if I'm not mistaken, but but they don't they, they don't they give it to all federations in the world, all right. But for for the Moroccans, those are peanuts, and for me for a, for a country like Benin, it's a lot of money, and then people start fighting to find ways of getting their hands onto that money, all right. So we need to find very creative ways of financing our football, our soccer, all right, to use the terms that some, pre some, some others, uh, others prefer, but our football, we need to <laughs> find a way of financing it in a very, in a very intelligent and creative way. Yeah. What I'm saying here, we need to limit our ambitions. We cannot build the stadiums, I mean, the stadia that you have around the world, you know, those big, you know, uh, stadia, we cannot build them. They cannot be as modern. We have to focus on what we need. Our people get out and play and love the game and enjoy the game and be healthy and be happy. This is, to me, this is where, this is where the focus has to be. So uh, FIFA should not be the main import, I mean, the, the most important factor in, uh, you know, organizing our football in our countries. The government has to jump in and our our capitalists too. You know, we have some, some of them are extremely rich, you know, mm -hmm. but maybe instead of just building their own academy or their own a, a center, you know, a football center or whatever, they should be helping the government to invest in those things. I mean, if they can, if they can afford to lose money because it is going to be, you know, a losing money experience anyway. Yes, and and I know you've based on on FIFA's uh, where where they've put their focus on the social economic value of the game, and also just talking about you know their interests. They also have their own interests when it comes to African football. It's still lagging behind. So let me paint a picture. Uh, you broke you Dr. broke up you you broke up a little bit. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm saying, let me paint a picture as we move on. Let me just quickly paint a picture of, let's say, Dr. Simon, you know, top leadership of CAF. What, what needs to be done? What would you do different when it comes to, you know, also when you're, you're dealing with FIFA? What would you do different for this continent to make sure uh, the football on the continent improves? Well, one thing is sure is that I'm not going to be the president of CAF anytime <laughs> soon. <laughs> Yes, you never know, but it's yes. Me, it's never going to happen. <laughs> yeah. because I've been away from the continent for a long time, mm -hmm. and then uh, I've not been involved directly in, 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 in football, all right? So in administration or anything. So, but hypothetically, if I'm uh, the president of CAF, as, I, will, I will just look inwards, all right? I will not worry so much about FIFA at this point. You know, I would look inwards and then try, try to strengthen our, our football. And for me, to strengthen our football, there are two things we need to do. 
we need to give it an identity we need to give it a character you know it has to be different from other footballs you know for example when we watch the brazilians we know yes this is brazil when we watch watch barcelona we know yes this is barcelona it's got to be different you know that is one thing but beyond that what i would focus on is what i would call you know uh, uh the poor man's preference i would i would i would focus on poor people i think this is this is this is what we have to do we are a continent of poor people we have to put those poor people first and put them at the center of what we do so uh i would probably be looking for money or one way or another but to invest in uh, creating an you know an ecosystem for our football that is going to be vibrant we, we need to get these people to play so training is going to be one thing access is going to be another thing that is those are very that's very important and then um uh, you know i mean training of administrators too, of 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 leaders those who are involved in in the organizing the game in administering the game uh, they need some training because that's another area where we are lagging yes. and of course you know um there, there are other things that we we need to focus on for example um the way our players are not are treated you know by our own uh, uh, sports administrators you know uh, first of all they don't earn el- enough money but when you look at the picture all over the continent you know many of them are not paid or they are not paid in time you know and uh, there is no legal framework for them to operate mm-hmm. you know if you visit the website of uh, the royal federation uh, 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 of, uh, of football the moroccan federation of football you know they have about they have about 90000 uh, you know uh, 90000 uh people who have i mean players you know who are registered registered players mm-hmm. you know we have to start doing these things you know we need we need a framework a legal framework to protect those who are playing and uh, the other thing i would say is that uh it is difficult for football to become a job at this point you know mm-hmm. when you know you take for example the two, uh, the biggest teams in ivory coast asec in africa they play a game and then there are about only 5000 players in in the in, in uh, watching i mean in the stands all right there is there are very few games that can mm-hmm. have more than 1000 players so we need to work on all of that how do we create you know uh, f- uh, football structures how do we create teams and 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 support them so that you know we can have what people call if 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 fan if we can have fan engagement we don't have fans so how can we have fan engagement mm-hmm. and 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 as you can see even with the obsession with the english premier league african uh, africans who are, who are obsessed with the english premier league you can see they still want to there is that desire to support football across the world uh, and from your point i'm just getting why is it that it's not being translated to our own home leagues or our own home countries and also you've touched base on the education of leaders uh, who are in african football just do we need when it comes to african football well you know uh, when it comes to um, the there is there is one ruling the bosman ruling you know that completely changed the relationship between africa and the rest and and, and the rest of the world and fifa and fifa and that was in 1995 when they decided that you know uh, african uh, players you know uh, could go and, and 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 play in europe all right they were not protected the way they used to be so they could go the, you know the ruling actually worked against africa in two ways first of all african players started moving to europe in big in big numbers in very big numbers so the best talents that we had 
you know, move to Europe. Mm -hmm. And then the, the 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 quality of the game in Africa itself, you know, was significantly reduced because our best players were going. And when they were going, they were at least trying to go. So they were migrating. There is a lot of migration of players a, across the continent itself, all right? With, within conditions that are not stable when it comes to uh, legal protection, when it comes to money and things like that. So that has completely destroyed the game. And what made even, so that, in, of, of course, there's, there was no revenue anymore. There was no income anymore. All right. And then the second thing that hit us badly is that our players left for Europe. So we wanted to see the drug bars. We wanted to see the Etos and so on and so forth. All right. Because it's good for our own, uh, our own ego. All right. It flatters our sense of identity. We look at these Africans from our countries and then they are able to play elsewhere and so on. And then we started paying to watch them. So all Canal Plus and, uh, you know, uh, the, the English Premier League, all of them started broadcasting to Africa. And then we are paying them to watch our players. So what, what, you, what you have here, we have no revenue coming in, all right, for the game. And then all our money is used, you know, to feed a system that we are getting almost nothing from. Yes. At least FIFA, when they get the money from uh, the TV rights, they give us some of it, or they, they, they redistribute it because it is part of the, 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 the sustainability, right? But mm -hmm. when you look at uh, uh, UFR Premier League, how do they, what do they give us? I'm not sure, you know, maybe some people who know this better than I do can tell me what they give us. But we just pay to watch them. A bit of the transfer, the yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a bit the of the transfer fees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, continue, continue. Yeah, we buy the jerseys and everything. And what is even happening now, you have, uh, uh, for example, in Ivory Coast, Africa Sport, one of the biggest clubs, you know, uh, that could not function anymore. In the past, it was very politically uh, managed, I would say. You know, the president was very close and the president of the club was very close to the president of the country. He was even one of his in-laws. So plenty of money was getting into it. So mm -hmm. when he left, the club could not function anymore. So what happened last year was that they signed a contract with a Belgian company, you know, uh, that is now giving them the equipment and that is basically buying the clubs. So what is going to happen in the future, I think, if we are not careful is that, you know, rich people from elsewhere will come and buy our clubs. Mm -hmm. And again, it means that, uh, I mean, they will bring some money for sure, but the, 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 the big question is that, is the money going to go to the poor people as I, our, as I was saying? Is it going to go to our, our, our communities, all right? So that, those are the questions. Yes, and if, we were to have like an African approach. What are some of the values we would seek to instill uh, to have a thriving and sustainable football ecosystem? Well, first of all, in terms of uh, identity, in terms of identity, you know, we Africans, we like fancy stuff, right? You know, there's yeah. the French word for, for it. I mean, if, but I think the French word is better in terms of uh, representing what it is. We like fantasy. We like, we like, you know, when you see, when we see players like Neymar, when we see players like Eto, when we see players like Abdul Razak in those days, or Abedi Pele, or no, you know, we love that. We love the dribble. We love to dribble. Dribble is very important, and a, a good dribbler can 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 win a game, right? So, I think that in terms of identity, we need to do that. We need to. We need to get our, ourselves to do what we like the best. And then we're going to produce a different type of football that the world can have fun with. And then they can pay into our football. Otherwise, nobody is going to give us money. I don't know. We are not more beautiful or handsome than the rest of the world for people to just say, hey, Sean, I like you. I'm going to give you all the money of this world. It's impossible. We have to produce something. Yes. So in terms of identity, we've had to work on that. 
uh, and maybe the way to work on that is to have more African coaches and then giving them a philosophy of the game, all right, mm -hmm. instead of, uh, you know, this training that is happening elsewhere and, and, all, and so on and so forth. Now, in terms of uh, leader, leadership, leadership and um, the type of capacity that we need to build, um, you know, I believe that to tackle the problem of African football, we, it's, uh, we need some... Uh, First of all, we need to be able to resist, you know, all the influences that are coming and that are not adapted to us, to our, our conditions. And then we can imagine a new football. So it's an intellectual test for us. It's an intellectual challenge, you know, to reimagine our football on the basis of our differences and on the basis of our similarities and also on the basis of our, you know, characteristics. What I say very often is that look at the market and then see how a market is functioning. And then you're going to learn a little bit about how you should manage African football. But in terms of leadership, we need to create a culture of collaboration because there is too much competition for nothing. You know, so we need to create a culture of collaboration where we exchange ideas, we try things. We give us we give ourselves time to fail and to take and to learn lessons and then to move on. We need to cultivate a diversity of ideas and personnel. I'm going to give you an example. You have uh, uh, Mr. He's a businessman. He's the owner of a club in in uh, in, in Guinea. His name is uh, Antonio Suari, Mamadou Antonio Suari. Mm -hmm. He is already the president of many types of of many many corporations in Guinea, Guinea, Guinea Airlines, you know, uh, but at the same time, he's the president of the federation. He's the, the, the owner of a big a, a football center mm -hmm. and he's building a stadium, I think maybe, maybe it's over now, a stadium of 15,000 people for his center. He is also the president of Wafu, you know, uh, he's mm -hmm. the president of everything. I'm not saying that he should not invite it, but you cannot have such such a person with so much money, you know, to be the only person to be making all decisions. Or if he is not making decisions, people are make, going to make decisions just to please him. So we need a diversity of ideas and a diversity of personnel. We need to trust each other, to trust our professionalism and our work. Uh, we go and get coaches from around the world because we don't trust our own coaches. This is, this, is, this is a disease and it is still plaguing us. We need to create a culture of flexibility, you know, and uh, in addition to that, we need to think long term. I think what Africa is suffering from African football and many other areas in, in Africa are suffering from short termism. Mm -hmm. We want everything right now. We, right now, we want the, the victory right now. We want the success right now. Uh, I don't know if it's because politicians have kind of, you know, taught yes. us to, believe, to think that way. We want mm -hmm. everything right now. This is short-term solutions are very short-sighted. We cannot continue doing that. And then another thing is that we need to know each other. Africans, to me, we don't know each other enough. And uh, we need to create a culture of in research and investigation. I'm sure some work is being done in the various schools, but we are not exchanging what we know or what we are created in, creating in terms of knowledge. You know, we are not exchanging that enough. Yes, amazing. And before we go to the last ones, let's now quickly take the comments and questions. Um, let's start with James Rogoy, who asks, Dr. Kindes, do we have a problem of importing coaches who don't understand the game in Africa? And if so, what can be done to train more young people to get into the game at all levels from administrators, physios, etc. Well, uh, the game in Africa itself has to be created, but it has to be created and has it has to align with the culture of with the various cultures in 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 Africa. All right, uh, to train more young people, well, we have to create schools. You know, schools are schools are very important. We need to create schools. There are there are a few schools around. 
Uh, we need to create those schools and get them into those schools. Uh, now, the problem is that you have different levels. You cannot create a school for a coach that is going to be coaching the national team. You know, you need to create, you know, very different levels of training for people to be able to function in the community. So to me, uh, you take a community, you get somebody from that community, you train them, and then they work for the community. Maybe one yes. example would be, you know, look okay. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay, yes. Give us, give us the example, give us the example. Yes, one example. No, what, what, I, was, what I was going to say is that in Kenya, uh, you you know there is a French coach that a French coach that is working in Kibera. I'm sure that you know him. His mm -hmm. name is Luc, mm -hmm. and he's he, he has uh, created a team, the uh, uh, Black Stars, I think, of Kibera. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, this is an example. He's a teacher. He's a French teacher. He's been uh, he's been teaching in Kenya for some time. So he is the type. This is the type of thing that we need to do. Take the teachers, train them, you know, take the students, train them, take the bricklayer, train them, and then put them back in the community to, 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 to spread the knowledge. Yes. And now we move to Peter Legge, where I say money for votes, that's what lubricates FIFA fiefdom. Can that change? If so, how? If not, then what should African football leaders do? Well, it is it, it it is probably not going to change, you know. Uh, as long as uh, in FIFA itself, you have such imbalance of power, and then you Africa, you know, Africa has fifty four countries, a big chunk. It is a question of transforming, you know, that power into a force. You know, to change uh, to change FIFA, maybe. All right, so Africa can do something. Uh, African leaders. Um, it it the, the problem is that we talked earlier about the autonomy of uh, uh, federations. All right, mm -hmm. so um, if leaders are autonomous, then they can, to a certain degree, do what they want. But the question is, how are we going to oversee those leaders? You know, um, I don't know uh, how this can happen, but African leaders, I mean, when you take football leaders, uh, there must be some structure to oversee the work that they do. Is, is it going to be the government? I'm not sure because the government can be in bed with them. So, of course, we need a lot a lot more. I mean, you, you know, uh, Gorbachev in the Soviet Union, he brought, he brought, uh, he brought on Peritroiska and uh, Glasnost. And that mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, more transparency and uh, more restructuring. So, uh, but the, the, the question basically is that you don't want to wait for people to be honest or to be, to have integrity. You need to put in place the mechanism to prevent them from being dishonest and to to make them uh, uh, to, to, I mean I mean to 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 run the system in a very honest way that's what you need to do mm -hmm. people are people they are, they are, if you don't control them if there's nothing they go, they're going to be I mean corruption in uh, European football was very prevalent also you know uh, even games were fixed and games are still fixed. All right, but if we put together system, if we put up systems to control them, things are going to be different. Yes, and we have also a comment uh, from Tom Boyer who says, yes, we need more transparency, honesty and integrity for all. And this also gets me to my point where we got from the last episode where uh, Dr. Moni Wakesa said, it starts with us, I think the change when it comes to seeing African football improve, starts with us. Yes, it does. I mean, transparency, honesty, integrity. Uh, we, as I said, we have to mm -hmm. put in place systems to make that happen. Otherwise, it mm -hmm. is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, it's got to start with us. But in African football, there is not just one voice. 
in African football, there are plenty of visions. There are competing visions. You have mm. those who want to have teams like uh, uh, Katumbi's team, Moise Katumbi's team in, in, in DRC. I'm talking about Tipi Mazembe. This is a guy whose players are paid a lot better than any player in Africa, all right? This is a guy who's, who's I mean, that has a, 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 fly, a, a, a plane to fly his players. He's built a stadium. He's play, he has plenty of money from, uh, from the mines. And then he has political ambitions. You know, mm -hmm. some people may be happy with that, but this is not the type of things that we need on this continent, right? You know, mm -hmm. I would prefer the guy who goes to Kibera or Matare or who go to all these uh, uh, slums and give some hope to, 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 to the players and, mm -hmm. and, and, and cultivate a sense, you know, of belonging, of community, a sense of life. That's what we need. You know, for example, uh, very quickly, Egypt, they don't have, they, they're not winning the World Cups. All right, mm -hmm. they are not doing as well as other Af Sub Saharan Africans, you know, in the World Cup. But they are winning the cups on the continent, and they are also making their players live decently, so they don't go, they don't go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. so these are the models that we need to to to, to follow, you know. So yes. the problem of vision is very important. Yes, um, and that's. What, let's just now move on to the next comment. And we had, uh, oh, let's do first the question and then we, we go to another comment. And we have uh, Ro Nyangeri. What is your view around co uh, cooperation of football clubs? Most African clubs are community organizations. Could transforming the legal forms of these clubs improve governance? Well, we cannot corporatize African clubs. You know, uh, what we may end up having is a super league of clubs that are owned by some rich people and that's it. But that is not what we need for African people. Mm -hmm. So uh, most African clubs should remain community organizations. And I think that they should operate in such a way that they reinforce community communities on the continent. And that is going to be, uh, that for me, that's, that's the way. Uh, well, um, we can certainly transform the legal forms of these clubs. Uh, that is very important. And that will certainly improve governance. That mm -hmm. I entirely agree with. Um, of course, there are corporate clubs that are existing now that exist. Um, I mean, if it is linked to a let's say, a, a, a corporation, a business, I would say, that makes money, yes, okay. But uh, uh, these owners that come and get clubs and then uh, manage them, I don't know if, I don't think that this is the way for us. But uh, certainly, uh, you know, doing more legal work is going to improve governance. Hello? Yes, I'm here. Sorry, okay. sorry about that. Technical issues. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so I was trying to make sure we are still flowing, but I had already uh, gotten your point out. You know, some, just transforming some of these systems uh, is actually very key to improving African football. So quickly, let's uh, wrap up with a comment from Dr. Hikabwa Chipande, who's the current head of African Union Sports Council. Uh, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in to the show and talk to us more about a African, Africa Union's role when it comes to sports. So his comment is spot on, Dr. Simon Akindes, on the role of the African Union Sports Council, how the African Union Sports Council can play towards the development on sport on the continent, providing a generic policy framework and platform. Well, uh, uh, the African Union Sport Council can... Uh, be strong in the role of advocacy. You know, they can advocate for African football, but 
they can uh, I they can also you know provide some kind of orientation when it comes to the way we think mm -hmm. you know when it comes to the way we organize our sports through the institutions you know there is a university uh, they have various institutions they can do that kind of role but i do not really think that they should provide a framework for every for, for every single country mm -hmm. because we have to take into account various factors first of all countries there are many levels there are many speeds in african football in south africa a soccer player can earn um, as much as 9000 euros a month mm -hmm. this is something that you can find also in morocco or you can find in egypt but when it comes to niger that is not possible maybe at most if, if a football player can earn let's say 200 dollars and that is that is even that is good or benin you know mm -hmm. where I, where i come from you know so uh, it is difficult it will going to be difficult to provide a, a generic policy framework for everybody you know uh, but what the african union can provide is some principles that mm -hmm. they should observe for me there is one thing that we need to do is to give preference to the poor to give preference to our people because when we are doing well our players who are who are really doing well around the world they come from those communities you know those who get excited and go to the games they come from those communities so we have to serve them so if the african union can make every federation and every government on the continent serve those communities then the african union will have done something tremendous thank you thank you and uh we still have another question oh, uh how can sub-saharan africa measure up with their north north and counterparts in the administration of football well um I think I've, I've, I've talked with uh, uh, one of the leaders of uh, Moroccan football. All right. Uh, the way we have to do it, essentially, is to trust our government to lead, you know, the building of infrastructure, to link the, the investment into football through various ways of taxation. You know, this, can, this is possible but it's going to be gradual. It's going to take time. So, um, you know, Northern Africans are not better than us really when it comes to football itself, all right? Maybe we are not better than them, you know, but a lot of African players actually go and play in those teams in Tunisia, in Morocco, and even in Egypt, all right? Mm -hmm. So the question really is to organize ourselves in our countries some countries are very rich some countries are very rich you know they can do a lot so and then we have some big capitalists like uh, antonio suare we have big capitalists like katumbi and those so they can invest but the question is where are they going to invest for for, then, this, game, for this game to take up i mean to take yes. up yes and I know most of them, even if they want to invest, they want to make sure the structures and the systems are right. And the leadership that we are talking about also today is the right leadership that can actually drive African football forward. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. And before we wrap up, just any last words. First of all, what is the future? What do you think is the future of African football? And then any last words, any last message to our viewers? Well, uh, about the future of uh, African football, the potential is immense you know we, we we have a big number of people who can play football we have a weather we have uh, a weather that uh, that is is good people can play all year round basically all right so um but what we need we need to do basically as i say is uh, give preference to the poor i, I call it the pre the the the, the, the uh, the, the perf uh, what the option has to be to focus on the poor uh, and the, our the, our you know poor communities basically 
uh, we have to resist, you know, these competing visions. I think that comes from el that that come from elsewhere that make us believe that we can do what others are doing. It is impossible. It is just impossible. You know, the structures are not there for us to do what others are doing. So, so we need to defeat. I mean, defeat is a maybe big term, but we need to at least avoid that vision you know, that comes from Europe and that makes us believe mm -hmm. that we can do it just the way others are doing it and be successful and with as much money. We just don't have the structures and, uh, you know, the mechanisms. Now, um, what uh, I would say uh, about, uh, about what, what is the question now? The second part of the question. Your last message My last to word. our viewers and well, how they I'm, then can I'm, get a hold of your work and everything. Well, I'm part of a group that is called Sports Africa Network. And what we do, we try to produce knowledge about, Af uh, about sports in Africa in general. All right, we've had, uh, uh, we have, we've had uh, maybe 11 conferences. I'm not sure about the number now, but we used to have those conferences in the US, but uh, for the past few years, we've had them on the continent. And the next one is going to be taking place in uh, uh, Port Elizabeth in South Africa. We, we've had one in South Africa. We had one in uh, Zambia. We had uh, one in Senegal. We are going to have another, the next one in South Africa. And maybe we're going to go to Morocco also. We want to cover the continent. So the idea is to produce knowledge that people can use. You know, when I was looking for materials for this presentation, I couldn't find a lot of things about Africa, but you have all kinds of things about other places. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we do. Um, I have an organization that is called Tuso Sport that we created, but the objective is just to promote, you know, sports at the grassroots level, you know, for health, you know, for um, a better environment, all right? And then uh, also, uh, for stronger communities. So that's something that I'm trying to develop, but it is not easy. So so these are the things that I would like to say uh, at this time. My work, my work, I write not so much about football, unfortunately or fortunately, all right? But I, but I do write about food, football sometimes, and uh, you can find me probably on the internet. Um, I write also about music and politics uh, and then also social movements and, and so on. I mean, that is my career, you know, political science. So uh, I don't know if there's anything else that I would like to say, <laughs> but I would like to thank you for uh, for the opportunity. And uh, it really pleases me that, you know, you are working so hard for this continent to, mm -hmm. to I mean, to to take off. You know, so I, I congratulate Brian, uh, Nurian, and you. Those are the ones Thank I you. know. Thank you, Karen. No. Thank you so much, Dr. Simon Adetona Akindes, for just, you know, talking to us, being open. That is what we love about this show, the Africa Football Business Show. You talk to us, you've been open, you, you haven't even held back. And you've also, in the end, given us solutions. And I hope the leaders and everyone everyone who's been watching they can get a few tips here and there that can help african football and they can help improve african football because we believe the time is now thank you so much for joining us thank you very much but people should start their thinking too yes so that is very good i mean yeah thank you thank you we are see you sometime grateful. again bye bye bye